Sure, let's get started. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, today is a special day. We have our special guest, uh, Jenny. She's uh, a great virtuoso of contemporary classical piano, graduate of Curtis and the Manhattan School, and uh, recently appointed as faculty member uh, proudly here at UC Berkeley. And uh, I understand today you're going to show us some pieces that um, incorporate uh, technology, which has been a uh, focus of some of your, your, your work with uh, contemporary musicians, uh, composers. Yeah, yeah thank you, Ken. Okay. And uh, I'll take over from here. So hi, everyone. I am Jenny Kutai. I'm a contemporary pianist and a founder of uh, Facer Institute of Music in Shanghai and uh, very proudly a new piano faculty at UC Berkeley. Um, it is very special for me today to be connecting with all of you during this quarantine time. Uh, I believe through art we can really connect and during social distancing time we should connect even harder. Well, let's try at least. And technology can serve us in this way when it's used well. And I'm really honored to have today the chair at uh, Chair of Stanford Music Department Yaroslav Kapuscinski, Yarek, with us. And uh, Yarek, will you say hi to everyone here quickly, please? So that, you know, everyone, you know, ask Yarek questions. This is your golden opportunity after my talk to ask questions directly to Yarek. Hello. Uh, yes, Yarek, it's me. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me to join. And uh, it's always a pleasure. I, am, I, am, I feel honored that uh, Jenny uh, yeah, plays my music and plays it so well. And now I know that she will, I guess, in, include some of that in, in tonight, today's uh, uh, show. So yeah, if, you ha if anyone has any questions afterwards, I'll be delighted to answer them too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Yarek. Yes, we'll indeed hear quite some pieces of Yarek's later towards the end of the talk. Okay, so let's start. Um, so recently I gave a, a TEDx talk on when classical music meets technology. And uh, so it's, it's technology is some part of the things. It's essential with what I do as a pianist. But let me recap you a bit first. So first of all, I want to show you my journey from a super, super classical pianist, like thousands, thousands and millions of pianists trained piano students, like this, <laughs> this, <laughs> to, to a bit more, yeah, my, I started designing my own costumes to this, prepare piano things, to this, <laughs> playing Cindy Cox um, etudes for synthesizers. This is playing Andy Akiho's, um, piece for two keyboards <laughs> and the same concert where I did a lot of crazy things, including Annie Gosfield's uh, baseball piece. Now you use baseball med and baseball to play on the piano. And then that's one of Yarek's pieces that I did in New York. That's uh, the boats or yachts, part of the side effects, a spectrum in New York. This is a calligraphy piece um, in Shanghai. I think it was the Mercedes Benz Center huge screen, they rolled out the piano. <laughs> and yes, very big screen. And this was very, very recent, my Aqua Alta, my global warming program in, um, in a residency with NASA scientists. So how did I get from a super, super well um, formed classical mindset kind of uh, musician, pianist to someone who I, I do all these um, adventurous and interesting things and collaborating with uh, living composers. Well, I guess, you know, we've got to start from when I went into, when I got into Curtis. So I got into Curtis when I was 13 years old and I graduated when I was 19. And I was one of these little kids there at Curtis. And Curtis usually is a super, super conservative kind of uh, music institute. And, they, they just like prodigies and then, yeah, they just play Tchaikovsky or whatever, um, forever. <laughs> and, but that's why music classes are so important. So when I was 14 years old, I, I went to a music literature class and I heard George Crumb's Black Angel and Harry Cowell's Ben Shee for the first time. And 
I had never heard anything like that in my life. I mean, do, do you know about Harry Cowles Ben Shi? So he's, you know, you know, play a lot, all the entire piece inside the piano strings, scratching and strumming, and it's all very, very uh, scary, scary sounds because it's an Irish ghost, uh, Ben Shi. So there's recently a new, um, very good um, music video I, I saw on YouTube, someone recorded with all like black nails and everything scratching and it really fits the <laughs> character. So it blew my mind. I was like, wow, I want to play this piece. And I never knew that um, piano pieces could be like that. It could be that scary. That's something new. <laughs> and it could be this captivating, this um, just this intense, you know. And, and I realized really for the first time that I don't have to play the same pieces and same classical repertoire over and over again. I mean, the overall classical piano repertoire, maybe several hundred pieces total, and then, or maybe a little more, I don't know. But then, you know, I hear my classmates play, I hear my teachers play them, and then famous pianists play them and record them, and then, then I play them, right? And then I ask myself, what's the point? <laughs> And so now this is different. This is something I could play that's refreshing. I could play inside the piano and I played it at the, my Curtis graduation recital and at least one audience thought I was tuning the piano. <laughs> and, uh, and, but you know, the thing is a lot of people think, I'm sure not you all, but still plenty of people think uh, contemporary music is not real music. You know, they think that it's something niche or something different. But of course, we all know that Beethoven was a contemporary, Schumann was contemporary, everybody, everybody in the history were writing for their colleagues and friends and playing their music together. And every generation composers try to push forward, break boundaries and even get inside the pianos and instruments. So over the years, I asked myself, then what's the true purpose of being an artist, a performing artist? And you want to hear what I got? <laughs> so for me, art needs to reflect the current state of our world. And this also to, uh, to raise awareness in people about social issues. And that's what artists could do to make a difference. And then, and then yes, I was in Venice. And you know what's in Venice? And coincidentally, I experienced Aqua Alta. So aqua alta is a thing that, um, that uh, the water just surges up. And then in like within 20 minutes, the entire San Marco Square was covered in water. And it was sort of a phenomenon. And it's like, oh yeah, talk about global warming as a hoax. Like, come on, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and so I then met with uh, Ian Fenty. Uh, a NASA scientist who specializes in global warming's effect on water. And um, I created this Aqua Alta Global Warming Multimedia Solo, solo Piano Concert, it's a long title, with NASA data visualizations. So I asked Ian to send me a lot of um, data visualizations from NASA on global warming. And then I commissioned many composers and then put music together and who expressed their own feelings through music on press, this pressing issue and using, um, and then artistically designing or playing with the data. Now I'm going to play a piece for you, or some pieces, actually three pieces. Um, the first one being Ligeti uh, Musica Ricercata number one. Um, with some of the data visualizations you will see. Let's see. Good. And I will mute my I will mute my voice here.
Yeah, so, so that was um, One Musica Ricercata. And then the next one is Muchaca, uh, Musica Ricercata number seven, also by Ligeti, um, that I paired with another NASA, NASA video. And, but this is actually, this video recording is recorded on a talk show, on a night show in Maine. So it's a little funny, but it's a, it's a good uh, recording, I think. Once again, Jenny Chai. Yeah. And then the next one is um, another, um, say, special treatment of the NASA visualization. And then it also has real time, um, say, processing, sound processing. So the sound, the music that I'm playing will be actually processed in real time by Cole Ingraham. So Cole is also a Yarek student, and that's how we met before. So this one's called Entropy, and I'm showing you the first movement. It's just a couple minutes long.
Um, so you could say that I'm a person who blurs the line between classical and contemporary, because I also program a lot of pieces that are more um, classical. But I feel like also I'm just going where music history is naturally going. Like it's like evolution. As a contemporary pianist, I'm responsible for selecting which pieces to play. The more I play them, the more likely they will last in music history. And now composers write for me and we develop pieces together and we even develop AI technology for visuals and electronics together to play with me. Um, here, you'll see there's my good friend Yarek, <laughs> which is who's with us right now. And this is us in front of Earcom. And we developed um, many pieces of Yarek's at Earcom. Um, especially working on this software, Entis Kofo. Um, it's an it's a AI score following, real-time score following um, software that predicts every note I play in real time, and then it reacts or recognizes it within 10 to 20 milliseconds every note I play, and then it um, projects uh, whatever it's told to do, like visuals or electronic sounds. So it's almost like me playing with... Um, a visual artist and a electronic musician live in the same time. So yeah, many people perform multimedia music, but often they do it with pre-recorded videos and then the musicians just follow it. But that's not enough. Of course, the performer needs um, her utmost freedom to express her musicality and to have her rebuttals. And that's the key difference playing in live music anyways. So Entes Kofo, um, allows us to do that. And um, so the images um, of Yarek's pieces supported by Entes Kofo is uh, syncing and matched note by note with the visuals. Um, let's see. Sorry, my thing is a little slow. Okay. So, um, Arsha Kant, who is the main inventor of Entes Kofo at Yerkan, he said, let technology serve art, not the other way around. So that's what I like about this technology that really allows musicians to have more space to create, to improvise, and it follows you. So let me show you now an excerpt some excerpts of Yarek's side effects. And the video projection are beautifully done by photographer, Polish photographer, Kaspar Kowalski. It's all, he, he's a pilot and a pilot photographer. It's all bird's view.
as uh, we are speaking, technology in our era is inevitable, and uh, especially now. Um, the thing is that we should also be aware that there are many faces of technology. We need to be more aware of the good and bad of it and to take better control in how to use technology to serve humanity. And it's funny because uh, it actually just happened to me recently also that I was supposed to be performing at the World AI Conference on top of the Shanghai Tower. And then guess what? I was replaced by robots. So the final decision by the Chinese government was that they wanted to have uh, robots playing piano instead of a real pianist playing using AI software. And I guess, you know, maybe I'm the, prop, maybe I'm the first pianist who is replaced by robots uh, losing the job. <laughs> but um, it, this is just a funny example of that. But, you know, as Andrew Yan has spoken about many times, there are millions of jobs lost because of uh, automation in the US. And this is the future um, we need to face as humans together. And technology has obviously already affected us in everyday lives. Social media gives us um, the illusion that we are connecting. And believe it or not, it's also damaging our love lives. Like the psychologist, uh, Alexandra Solomon said that uh, nowadays, while we are listening while texting, texting while watching a show, watching a show while scrolling Facebook, we seem to rarely put ourselves whole self in one place at one time. And that's the thing. Um, real life, real love needs true, true presence, real listening and real growth. And uh, Dr. Solomon calls the face-to-face -face undivided attention, the big P presence, and then the text message or micro interactions, uh, Facebook likes and pokes as a small p presence. And love and um, connection and empathy, these are the true needs of human beings. And the digital era misleads us to believe that there can be, that can be achieved by technology. But psychologists all know that's, that cannot replace in-person interactions. And for me, Performance, performing art is a great way to rebuild this big P presence. And giving a concert or going to a concert or, um, you know, just being there in that moment is about truly sharing and listening and feeling. It's like a moment form. The moment only exists when I perform a piece for you live or, or you're listening to it live. And, um, and then, let music take you wherever you want. Sorry, my, my uh, slide, it was acting up again. So, so yes, for me, performing art is like a truly undisturbed moment for sharing and for self-reflection. And that is really important. And I hope when we get out of this social distancing time, we will not forget and we will try to connect and make music and go to concerts and make music and perform at concerts even, even more. And now I would like to share with you an, an excerpt, some excerpts of live concert performances, videos of uh, Yarek's um, other piece, Calligraphy for Zichi. And uh, this is a piece that uh, Yarek very, very thankfully wrote for me. And it explores on this ancient Chinese story. It's a love story or almost love story between two Chinese musicians and one called Zichi and one called Boya. So they always meet every year at a particular time and place to play music with each other together. And then one year, one time that uh, Bo Ya realized Zichi was nowhere to be found and then he heard that Zichi had died. So he broke his qing, he broke his um, instrument and he said, without my true listener, I would never play again. So, so it's about cherishing this, this connection, a musical connection. So this is also a piece between the, it's like a dance between the calligraphy movements and piano. Thank you. 
Yeah, so um, these are pieces that were all run by Entos Kofo, and I, I really enjoy the playfulness and the imagination of all the creations by Yarek. And um, so besides using performances to connect with people, I also try to use music education as a way to connect. Um, the music school I created in Shanghai nine years ago with Polish pianist Peter Tomasz, face art, Institute of Music has a mission. 
that is creativity and human interaction. So we started our co-creation festival where students have, um, uh, students play with their teachers and they compose for films and they write music for piano and other instruments. And at the end of the festival, everyone gets on stage and perform for each one of us and together. And then um, we also recently opened up um, music technology, ethno music composition lessons, so on and so. And um, yeah, we just have a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> one, one good thing being, you know, my own school that I could do whatever and I could uh, invite all my good friends and coming from um, all over the world, Europe and US to support. And uh, we do also uh, lots of uh, publicity sometimes. That's Dr. Mikowski coming from the School of Music and then we sign his books and, <laughs> and then we do concerts. Um, yeah, faculty and then we do lectures uh, and then I play with my little student. We even design the dresses together. Um, and then yes, we give more talks, our faculty and visiting faculty. And this is uh, Antonio Juan Marcos from UC Berkeley. He was also there in Shanghai last, uh, last summer. And then also Sam Wu, uh, a, a new uh, uprising Asian American composer. And then we also party. We also, we cut cakes. We, <laughs> we eat and we drink and toast and then we enjoy the the, the, the view of Shanghai, the modern view. And uh, on top of uh, my own school, I also give um, quite a lot of other um, events. For example, this is the Shanghai Media Group SMG. It's like a NPR uh, in China. And then they broadcasted uh, my workshop with the students, lots of students. Yes, a lot of fun. I, I brought up the uh, prepare pianos and also um, the baseballs, of course, together, and we all played with that. And then these are the recent ones during the quarantine time. I had already shot um, 16 episodes of online piano lessons called Kung Fu Piano, actually teaching using Kung Fu, relating to Kung Fu to piano techniques and teaching. So these video courses just got released in China. So um, as, a, as a, this media theorist, Douglas Rushkoff said, we have to stop using technology to optimize human beings for the market and start optimizing technology for the future of our humanity. And that's what um, I hope to do. And I, I hope that I'm, I'm trying my best to use technology to assist music performances and to create music together. And um, during this time, and I hope that we're connecting even harder. And uh, right now, I would like to invite you to listen, watch the last piece that I'll be playing for you today. And it's a complete performance of Yarek's uh, Only Stream. In this piece, Yarek has turned the piano keyboard to a typing keyboard. And every key is uh, typing out a letter. And then the whole piece is typing out a poem. And it's also run by Antoskovo. Only Stream.
So yeah, this concludes my talk and video, video online performance of the day. And uh, so do you uh, have any questions? Um, please seize the opportunity to ask me and especially Yarek questions. Um, how do we do this? I'm new to this group thing. So, but come up, come up. Any questions? Hi, I think um, Curtis, you had a question? Yeah, <laughs> I'm the official assigned uh, questioner. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, so I had a question actually uh, unrelated to technology about, uh, I think, but specifically, I, I guess it is related to the way that you work with technology uh, 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 with, uh, you know, as an interpreter, you are uh, uh, interpreting pieces that uh, have often uh, uh, really overt uh, political messaging or uh, really strong narratives that uh, uh, you aren't uh, uh, necessary. Well, I don't know whether you're in control of those those narratives, uh, and that's a collaborative process of of developing them or if you think of your role as an interpreter as to uh, to perform the pieces uh, regardless of, of uh, it, you know, and the composer and the videographer uh, create that material and then your role is to perform it. Um, and then sort of the, the flip side of that, uh, you know, so I think that's that aspect of your work is sort of uh, uh, the traditional role. But then the flip side of that is you are, at least with the Ligeti pieces, essentially reinterpreting uh, 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 Ligeti in a way that, uh, 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 you know, I would say unquestionably outside the bounds of his intentions of the piece, whether they would be consistent with his political views or not. Um, uh, and so in that sense, you're sort of blurring the role of interpreter and performer and composer in the opposite direction. Uh, so I wonder just how you think about, you know, your relationship to the music as a set piece of text, your relationship as performer that has a voice or is conveying somebody else's voice, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, what I enjoy doing, so, so one other reason that I decided to go completely into contemporary music was because um, I, I did not want to, um, I basically did not want to make a living through performing because, you know, as a, a performer who plays just new music, it's very like unlikely. And, and perhaps now I'm not at that point anymore, luckily, but you know, usually it's very unlikely to make a living from just performing concerts, especially new music. Um, and, but I didn't want to uh, play just classical music so I can, I can you know, live on just repeating and playing whatever presenter, concert presenters want me to play. Um, and um, luckily, um, the, uh, a management company, Aero Artists, found me, and uh, they were looking exactly for artists like me who would um, create their own music uh, program. So basically, my, my concert programs are always themed, and uh, I do love the liberty and the independence of programming, um, really creating, it's almost like a script writer, um, really piecing all the, choosing all the pieces and then talking to composers, commissioning them, asking them um, to write pieces or, or to make pieces with visuals that particularly fit uh, my themed concerts. So all my themed programs, um, this, there's the global warming one, that all the pieces are about water and some, like you saw, um, Ligeti, the, those ones that are more classical, there's actually also Orlando Gibbons and uh, Liszt and uh, WC, other pieces that I chose to match um, the data visualizations or multimedia works that are still conveying the same global warming, water rising idea. So, so as that, that as an example, and then all my other programs too, some it's like one called uh, sonorous brushes that explores the synesthesia 
aspect of colors and sounds. And then um, also the work with Yarek. So Yarek had written some of the pieces um, before, and uh, I saw those pieces were really somehow thematically tying to the themes of the concerts that I wanted to program. And then also we collaborated together to find this Chinese story and calligraphy. And then we actually flew to Shanghai three times together making lots of like huge crews and shooting and, and 4K cameras and stuff. It was quite complicated, but um, it was really, this one was really even more special because um, it's really like making a movie. It's like start seeing it from the beginning to the end, the whole production phase almost and testing. And we always went to Ircom or other places over the world to test and to, try to reproduce technically, um, technologically well these pieces. So I would say, yeah, I, I enjoy very much. Um, I, I think that's why I'm doing it. And I still have lots of fun doing it because I have my own voice and I get to create my own programs. If that answers your yeah. question. Curtis? Oh, unmute yourself. Yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't find the unmute button. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, so it sounds like that that process is. And what about with the with the Polish filmmaker? Those were particularly beautiful. The the films. Uh, was that a collaborative collaborative process between the three of you to to come up with that piece, or uh, uh, did you all sort of, well, at least Yarek and and I can't remember the name of the filmmaker. Did you two work independently, and then and then uh, uh, yeah. you you interpreted it? How did that process work? Well, that maybe Yara could answer that even better. Oh, happy to answer this. So uh, the story of that one is that uh, I just accidentally happened to see an exhibition of the photographs of uh, Katzberg Kowalski, and um, when I saw them, I felt that they have this kind of uh, beautiful. Uh, quality of at the same time showing the world in its, uh, in its visual literal form and be beautifully composed abstractly. And that's how I think about music. Music has uh, walks on the ground. And for me, it's not just a, uh, it's not an abstraction. And I guess we probably all share that, how, particularly in these times, we know how much, how important it is. And, 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 uh, so I, I just went to a gallery that, that uh, shows him and, and asked the manager there, can I contact the artist uh, because I would love to speak with them. And, and, uh, and uh, they actually uh, connected me and I asked him, have you ever worked with video? Have you ever worked with time? And then it turned out that he had some uh, uh, videos that you just saw uh, that he didn't know what to do with. And uh, so that was a, a really wonderful coincidence because I basically said, well, show me, can I, can we pick some? Because he, he had actually multiple and, and uh, some of them are much longer, this, this and that. So, so we spent, it was a collaborative process to some degree because we, we went through all those together and decided which ones to pick and which sections to pick. And, and uh, we, I played for him various musical interpretations of them and, and asked them even specifically uh, about um, how, how he feels about the development of certain things. How, so it was a, a, a really nice conversation about understanding of what these images are. And of course, I was surprised with uh, my own understandings of it as he was, uh, and yeah, so it was a collaborative process in this unusual circumstance where a lot of material was ready. So it was not, there was not that much in, in some ways to, to change. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it, it is surprising how contextualizing, music can contextualize your image as, you, as everyone knows here, I'm sure, uh, in many different ways. So, uh, but he was totally present in that process and we met in a different city for whatever other reasons and, and we spend hours, uh, me on the piano with his visuals and just trying to see how, uh, how we both feel about uh, reinterpreting his material. I would like to add that um, even though I was not part of the initial uh, creation process of this piece, I also love, love, love this piece. And I'm very excited that uh, Yarek and Casper, uh, uh, they've decided to make a piano concerto for me. Um, so it will be a piano concerto with Casper's uh, video images. 
Yeah, so this one is, is going to be more from the beginning organically developed and, uh, and unfortunately some of the shooting is now blocked because <laughs> yeah, for obvious reasons. So we'll see where that goes, but uh, it's, it's a very interesting process. Katzpah is a, um, a, a certified pilot and uh, he really, uh, yeah, has, has a very special way of seeing, seeing the world. I see through the group chat that Sarah Bai has a question. Sarah? Hi, can you hear me right now? Yes. Okay, so thank you so much for the talk, um, especially the photographs. I really enjoyed seeing how excited um, the children were. And I was wondering, or maybe both for Jenny and for Yark, what inspired both of you to create your first composition? And also, could you elaborate a little bit more on how you collaborate together? What is the process like from to the very beginning and ultimately to say performance day when it's premiered? Well, I, I could go first, but I'm not sure exactly which uh, first composition, Sarah, you meant. Oh, just um, in general, say when you were younger and you were first starting out um, that process. Um, when I was like three years old, I started playing piano, but um, I, I, I don't remember particularly, but I remember my first contemporary music concert uh, that I programmed all by myself. It was uh, 11 composers in New York at the Stone. Uh, it's like a kind of a John Zorn's place. Um, I have some videos still online, I think. And I, that time I just played, I was such a newbie in contemporary music and I was just so enthusiastic about all these extended piano techniques. So including the baseball piece, but then also the ligati because it was like, especially ligati disorder, the, you know, the, the first A2 disorder. It's just so, so difficult. And I was just so amazed by the complexity of it. And then there are other pieces, just all the new pieces. So I played 11, composers pieces there at one concert and many of them were present which was very exciting also for me and stone was this tiny spot but it was like packed and it's like has this reputation in new york like new york downtown is a hot spot and um i just remember it was so packed and then last minute i decided to do um moment form which sort of like the um like the pierre boulez idea of the moment form where you rearrange in the moment any any order of the pieces so i had uh, 11 numbers in a in a hat and uh, i was asking people just to draw any any uh, piece and i would start and then guess what the hardest piece like the first piece was a uh, negative disorder and then i remember annie gosfield she was uh, uh she was the she's the composer of the baseball piece and then she drew it and then she drew her own piece. She was like, I knew it. <laughs> it was just, uh, you know, very interactive and very fun. I, I hope to recreate that sometime in a, in a more intimate, um, I guess, um, setting that would work well. Then I, I will pass the question to Yarek. Yeah, so, so of course, there are some beginnings that you don't really remember. Uh, and, and of course, when you're young and, and you begin to touch that instrument and it makes sounds you kind of at least probably many of, of composers have the same experience that you don't even notice when you begin composing and creating these sounds that you want to hear and and so on so uh at least for me i i always try to recuperate that whenever i'm composing even now is i i, I love to try to bring myself to this beginner mind of what is it that I actually want to hear? Uh, what is it that, 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 that I, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, so, so in that sense, uh, I, every piece is, is, and I think that even if, if it's not that um, innocent, <laughs> because there are so many other things that are not just pure sound that, that are as, but there are si similarly, invigorating in some ways and you you want to express them you want to point them out or something as a composer so so that's always the process um one of the important firsts for me was probably when i started working audiovisually and that is uh, uh that was many years ago i was uh, in in the um residency at the band center for the arts which uh, is a, an extremely, even now, a luxurious place for artists. You're, you're really empowered by, by the center, by the resources uh, to, to, uh, 
to do <laughs> whatever you want. And I, I was coming uh, from, uh, from um, several years already of being extremely active and uh, as a pianist doing contemporary music, uh, playing other people's music. And, and I ended up in, in Banff where this, this is where talking 88 when the phone is extremely expensive. So I was, and, and I, there were no cell phones, there was no internet or anything. And it was, I was in the middle of the mountains and I finally had to listen to myself uh, without anyone wanting anything from me. It was a, a frustrating two months at first of, of almost, uh, it, yeah, the, the, it, it was one of those when I returned to listening to myself and I realized that what I really wanted to hear is, is or experience is, is some kind of audiovisual, more holistic, uh, more like dance of the world rather than just music. And uh, so that was kind of an important first when I remember going to the mountains and just shooting a stream and realizing that, yeah, this is the, this is the dance. This is, this is what, what I'm interested in. This is how my imagination works. I, I, I love to see imagery and I think about it as music. And, and um, uh, this is not a piece that I show anymore. It was, uh, uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, it was a very important kind of discovery, understanding that, that kind of flow, whether it's a flow of a stream and a visual flow, or is it a musical stream? It's just uh, very, very strongly connected the way my, my mind works. And uh, dancing that, dancing that stream, dancing that sound uh, is, is something that I just like to do as an artist and, and, and hope to take you with me on that. And I think with Jenny, that's how col our collaboration actually works, I think, is that we have similar joy. I, I probably, uh, uh, I'm not saying anything wrong here, uh, uh, is, is that, yeah, the, 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 I, I, there's no surprise to me that Jenny is showing to you all these things that normally in a musical presentation may not be, uh, you know, if you talk about music, you, the, the tradition, not anymore maybe, but it used to be that you analyze the, the, the object of music as uh, notes. And, and what they add up to. Uh, but, but of course, music is uh, all of those things that Jenny was showing is, is the people in it, is, is the children learning it, is uh, how you talk about it and with whom and, and, and where and whether you have food afterwards while still talking about it and, and all of that. And, and so that collaboration for me is one of the most wonderful things uh, about music is, is that exactly, it's, it's your life. It, it connects me. It's, it's, uh, the piece is, uh, of course, important uh, and, and, it's, and it has a life of its own and, and it reaches others in, in a different way, but the process of making it is extremely rewarding and, uh, and fascinating. And, uh, and yeah, particularly that, that, that piece, as Jenny was saying, the, the one uh, uh, with calligraphy, we had so many different uh, experiencings through it. We thought that maybe there would be a Gucci in it. And so Jenny was even studying uh, uh, Gucci and we thought that we were going to record her hands uh, playing the strings. We, we had so many different things that never ended up in the piece, but they ended up in our memories. And I think it's, it's, uh, they're part of that piece for us. And, and I, I, I just, love that yeah absolutely Derek. it's very beautiful beautiful experiences always and fun thank you yeah andrew um i've got a question uh mostly for jenny but i guess a little bit for yorick as well um in say side effects and the ligety program or the entire uh uh, water program, it seems like you're, the, the content you're dealing with is um, of a kind of like, um, say larger than human life scale um, and almost kind of like, uh, it's about these large scale processes that are almost past uh, kind of Anthropocene. And I'm wondering, uh, how you see the piano in relation to that, like, kind of post anthropocenic kind of uh, view? Oh, that's a really good question. I'm sh I'm not sure if I really ever had thought about that or focused on that. Um, for me, I never thought that I was just playing the piano. You know. Um, even though I was very much trained as a pianist, I never thought I'm so crazy about the piano. 
itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a way, it's like a thing, a tool to make sounds, but even sound itself is not just sounds. And, and maybe this has to do with um, my Chinese background or something that um, even though I, I left China like when I was 12 or so, but still I think not the modern Chinese, but more like the ancient Chinese way of view of things and culture that everything is extremely associated together and symbolic. And um, I'm very much a, philosophically speaking, I'm very much a Taoist. I know uh, Yarek is a uh, Zen, Zen Buddhist or Japanese Zen Buddhist or some sort. Uh, I'm more of a Chinese Taoist. <laughs> In a sense that um, a lot of things I think are, are just way bigger than individuals. Although individuals are also very important because this is our individual uh, the movies we perceive of the world are the movies we play in our own heads and it's extremely individualized. There's no two identical movies, even if we are here now um, talking and sharing the same information. Uh, but the experiences are extremely personalized. Yet, um, when you take the other perspective, everything is so much bigger than individuals and humans and, and everything, but yet everything's together. And music, I'm sure many people have talked about it already, is it, highly symbolic. It could be very precise to some degree that people are like, wow, this, this note, this nuance, this color means exactly da 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 to me. But then on the other hand, it's a language, it's not translatable, but it's, it's somehow, um, it's somehow in a in approximate but yet still quite precise way spoken between all of us who who do something with music or who even hear it differently and work with music and and to me music is everything music is life is living is relationships is collaboration friendship feeling connection it is also awareness it's also awareness of our space our world our earth our universe and it's it's time it's it's moment so that that moment form that the time that whatever we perceive at, in a time and also similar to um there's a book called brain society or, or like cognitive science that a lot of things when you look at musical forms uh it's similar to how um cognitive science see our um our brains working that there are many things on many levels happening at the same time so there's like local level and they're higher 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 and bigger um all the way to perhaps the universe or the beyond the earth kind of view but all happening in the same time and that that's somehow how i maybe perhaps uh intuitively navigate through my programming if that <laughs> answers anything yeah thanks <laughs> if I, you know, uh, maybe my answer will be from a different angle. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have to say that I have, I feel a certain discomfort about uh, piano and image. This is the weirdest thing because m I think 95% of my work is uh, for piano and image. And yet I feel an actu actual discomfort about it. Uh, <laughs> it's like me not being so crazy about being a pianist, but why? <laughs> uh, and I don't know whether that's that's actually what what you, Andrew. Nice to meet you, Andrew. Uh, uh, you are kind of referring to. It's that it is an, uh, the, the the piano is such an arbitrary and such a powerful cultural object that has so much meaning to it, and 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 and, and various kind of baggage too, and so so it's uh, so it's somehow overwhelming. And uh, so the only excuse I have for it, one is I'm a little bit like these blind Biwa players. Um, you know, I uh, I am I'm kind of stuck with it. I there there is there is there is a certain ability that I have or disability that uh, uh, holds me to it. Uh, and uh, this is one answer. Uh, a better answer maybe is actually the last piece, um, that, which is in fact all, much older. Uh, I do like when the, I have a very good alibi to have a piano on stage. And of course, uh -huh. the piece in which the keyboard it becomes another keyboard, it, it's, it feels very organic. Uh, another good answer maybe is that in side effects, the, the way Katzpa has uh, uh, shot uh, all of it is, in fact, if you see the book, because there's a book called Side Effects. Side Effects, what are the side effects? They're the side effects of human beings on Earth. 
and mm -hmm. uh, on the presence of, of human beings on earth. And so in that sense, I guess it, it, there is an alibi for a pianist with all of its culture invading and, and, and in some ways uh, imposing something um, controversial or, 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 or not. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I think it's an excellent uh, question that I have not really solved. Uh, but as I say, I feel somehow blind and, and I, uh, and, but I still need to sing my narrative. So, uh, but it's, it's, I'm on the, on the way. Do you have suggestions about it? I would love to actually hear your <laughs> thoughts about it. Uh, I mean, I don't have any suggestions. I guess what I'm, uh... Yeah, that was exactly what I was kind of getting at is um, the piano seems to have such a kind of long history that's so tied with humanism. And so um, I think one of the, it seems like there's a really interesting dissonance in side effects between this kind of humanism that is the pianist on stage and, and playing this um, this music that is kind of like it is actually uh, still very much tied to the repertoire of piano music um, and how that is kind of, how that has this interesting counterpoint with these like much larger time structures and this kind of larger global perspective on the earth. Yeah, and I, I don't like have any it. suggestions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I don't think that the piece fails. So it's, I'm not no, saying no, that, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that you're saying it. I, I, even if I say that I feel certain discomfort, I'm not saying that you know that that I'm uh, embarrassed about it. And in fact, and I love the way Jenny plays it. I think that she brings also into it maybe even more of that kind of culture of of classical music. Uh, that even when I perform it, I may be more zen and and extreme in some ways. And I love how she just goes into it with with all the rubatos and and uh and these associations that you're talking about but yeah but there is a contrast that i totally acknowledge uh, that that is there but i i also um but somehow that the, the fact that they are inconsolable or how do you say in that they do not fit is in fact somehow interesting to me i i that that's maybe a part that i like also as it's it's somehow uncomfortable, but there's something nice about that um, discomfort too. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Any other questions from people taking the colloquium? I have a question. Um, I, my question is for Jenny. Um, I was wondering, a lot of the pieces that you um, showed and discussed seem like they're pretty intensive to learn and I'm kind of wondering how do you um kind of as you're like let's say you've learned a piece and how do you kind of zoom out after learning the initial like the initial learning process to think more about um what you're hoping to communicate with it um, and I guess I'm, I'm also curious about this in the sense of like you've been for performing for a really long time now um, and kind of maybe how that's shifted over time. Um, and then like second kind of facet of this question is um, especially when you're performing with um, with visuals, like how you kind of approach your perf um, your interpretation uh and so it can meet the visuals if you kind of develop that together if you develop it separately and then go to the visuals after um let's see so the the first question first um i i have been performing for a really long time already and uh um it, it's sort of just it's part of growing up process and it does change over the time so yeah you know, i i was uh since first grade, I was selected to be the one of the like 10 in my grade, like 10 professional pianists, piano students at the Shanghai Music Conservatory. So uh, we had like really intensive um, practicing schedule and then every month we will need to perform. So I remember I used to always play like make one mistake on stage. It has to be just like one. <laughs> and uh, 
And it was like a highly, highly intense and competitive kind of um, environment and not in a good way. It was like that back then it was like teachers were really mean and then others like parents and all that, they were like talk down at you and stuff. It was like terrible. <laughs> and and uh, well, I was lucky that I survived that and maybe probably just like tune it out. It was maybe a good thing for me that I was in such a, oh, well, it's like too, too highly aggressively competitive environment too early and then I learned to tune it out. At some point, I guess, you know, as a survival mechanism, you have to turn it out, tune it out or you'll have to quit. So I guess I just uh, learned to tune it out. And then, um, then for a really long period of time, I think I, I just got more and more um, relaxed about it. I think before there are periods that um, later when I felt like I did my best on stage was when I, I have a Jewish mom who's a wonderful psychoanalyst in the country. So we just adopted each other. So I'm her Chinese daughter and she's my Jewish mom. And uh, so she said that, um, um, and, and her special area is artists and psychology. And uh, she said a lot of artists, the better the artists are, the easier they are to enter a dissociative stage. So um, the musicians who are c performing on stage, when they're really just, you know, like disregarding everything else, like nothing else, it's just, you know, music leading them. And I let music lead me always. It's not just like me projecting the music. It's more like I'm the passive one. I let the music flow. Like it just naturally goes wherever it goes and it takes me with them, with the music. And um, so, so that's when I enter the dissociative stage. And then to a point, and then I think the, my last uh, studying experience when I was in Cologne studying with Pierre Laurent Aymar, you know, the great contemporary um, mind and pianist, um, and but still very French, even though, you know, he's much more the Pierre Boulez kind of French and not so French type, but still actually he's very French. And uh, so I remember the first, uh, first lesson with him and he was like, Jenny, you know, uh, when you play a piece of music, it's like, um, it's like French painting. So it's like, you don't look at it, at it like this up close, you look at it this way. And then when, when I started piece or music, he would say, well, unscroll the paper. It's like unscrolling the paper. And, and uh, so it creates a, and then it was all about like technically like touche. It's all about like touch the piano. And then the music goes from somewhere else, like from or behind, inside the piano strings, and then it goes above you and all that. So it creates this like even acoustic rate, but I guess also uh, it changes psychologically your approach to the instrument. So you're no longer like playing the notes anymore. You don't really care about that. You're just like projecting the sounds and the sound waves and imageries and all that. So it shifts my uh, focus um, to really what the music, the meaning, the sound effects, what the colors are about instead of, um, you know, worrying about the notes. So once I get comfortable with the pieces, now I don't have any stage fright, luckily. Um, and I, I feel confident to just develop, deliver the colors and the imageries in my head. And uh, I'm sorry, what was your second question? Sorry, um, I, I went away. Okay, um, so my second question um, was kind of how, how you, when you're working with uh, pieces that have visuals right. in them, um, how does this all kind of come together if it comes together simultaneously or separately? Well, um, it depends on what I, I, other things I do, like uh, composers give me some things and I play with it, but most of the um, audiovisual works I worked with intensely are with Yarek's pieces and with Yarek. So those, even if he had written pieces um, before already, we actually went to Ircom or we tested in other places um, note by note these pieces from the beginning. So we actually could use Entis Kofo well and we, we, we tweet it, uh, well, Yarek tweaks it and I play it and then he tweaks the programming software of Entos Kofo and see if it matches well and you know, it responds well and all that. So, so in that sense, I feel very much a part of the process and the creation of the final work. And I'm just one of the components, like I, I'm just delivering the piano part of it. And then there's the visual, there's the electronic sounds of it and the whole story about it. It's like I'm one of the actors in a movie. So I, I feel very comfortable playing Yarek's works. Cool, well, thank you. Yeah, definitely answers what I was thinking about. I see, what did you think of that? Oh, sorry? 
I'm sorry. I was thinking. I was asking if you had some other expectation or expected to answer. Oh no, or? that I just said that it answers what I was thinking about. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You know, I would just add one thing. This is a very important question because it's true that audiovisuality, performing audiovisually, it's not something that people have at home as a setup. Mm. And so I cannot expect a pianist, any pianist, to actually practice audiovisually because it requires of them having max MSP. It requires of them potentially to have a projection somewhere in front of them. And uh, if, if they are to really shape an audiovisual flow, it's, it's a little bit, you know, you need to be able to see it as you're playing it to, to really think about it. You know, if you think about the piece, like the last piece, uh, uh, Ollie's Dream, if you want to tell that story, it's a, it's a little bit like singing a song there without, without actually your voice. But you need to narrate it by playing music. So you, you should be able to read the text as you're playing it because you need to speak it in a, at a certain speed that seems to be rhetorically correct or whatever you're imagining. So, so it is tricky that way because of course, as I say, not everyone has that kind of setup. So that's why it's good that we, for example, with Jenny, we, we, we would have multiple rehearsals where, where normally she cannot practice like that at home, but, but she can, uh, although now we have kind of a setup that, that, that she can, but, uh, but I, I, this is where, where for me, it's so important then to adjust the piece with her or to, to use Antiscofo in a way or compose the piece that gives the musician the freedom to, to, um, to flow with the music. So it's part of the work is actually on, on, on my end as, as a composer to make sure that it's uh, uh, not fail safe, but, but as fail safe as I can. Uh, and, and Jenny is actually quite a wild uh, card in terms of uh, with her, her tempi and her rubatos. She's so influenced from one day to another that, that, that she really pushes Antescofo to its borders. <laughs> Did that uh, influence your decision to use Antescofo as opposed to other kinds of tracking methods? Uh, well, you know, Antescofo is really useful for me uh, for uh, w one reason is that it's it actually has a very nice, uh, uh, I, I guess, artificial intelligence component of getting what's happening. <laughs> it really follows uh, pretty nicely, although just a regular follow object that I used to use before. Uh, is pretty good too. The only thing is that and the Scofo, of course, allows you to use any piano because you just put these two tiny mics in, inside the piano and, and it just works with, with such speed that it sounds as if you had an, a disc clavier. Because I, I used to work with, with uh, a disc clavier piano, which for those of you who don't know, it's, it's a piano which actually sends out MIDI from the keyboard, so it's immediate. It's basically the, whatever key you press, it's a number, it goes on the computer, and the computer immediately knows what it is. With Antescofo, it actually uses microphones and it analyzes the audio to recognize what pitch is being played. So you would think that it will take much longer. Well, computers are so fast now that it's, it's, it's practically immediate. And of course, it creates problems because piano is a, a instrument that has a pedal and it creates harmonies and if you hold pedal a little bit longer or less long it actually sometimes doesn't recognize what's what what is the sonority so it has its risks but the advantage is that yeah Jenny can go to almost any concert hall or I I still sometimes do uh, and and not depend on have, needing to have a disc clavier Were there any other uh, musical considerations knowing that you would use uh, Antiscofo that maybe um, if you weren't using Antiscofo or if you were using some other tracking device you, you might have composed differently, Yarek? Oh, definitely. I'm sure that, that, that it, it, it has a major impact. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that I, the, the way I work is not, uh, I don't use a lot of improvisation in, I mean, I, I maybe improvise when I compose or something, but, but once I, I compose the piece, it's pretty much set. So Antescofo is very useful because it, Antescofo actually comes later, you know, it's, 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 I, I, I can, um, 
I, I can improvise. In fact, I have a, not really a disclosure here, but I, I have a system that I, I can develop the piece without Dante Scofo. And, uh, and so it's once it's ready, then I only use it so that it becomes, let's say, uh, uh, publishable or, 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 per, or performable by very, various ways. But I, I, I can imagine uh, if, if, if you have different ways, different strategies of, of um, uh, of conceiving of your work in terms of uh, the, if you want, if I wanted to be able to improvise, if I wanted to have a certain kinds of freedoms that a lot of music right now wants, then Antiscofo would not be the right tool because Antiscofo is stuck by trying to recognize what note you're playing and then you need to, and then based on that, it's, it makes his decisions, but it compares uh, everything to a pre-existing score. So the score must exist. So if you compose with a score that has specific events in a specific order, then Antiscofo is for you. But if, if it isn't, uh, then, then you should use different tools. Any other questions from people in the colloquium or anybody else? Pamela, did you raise a, your hand? The, the mic. I think your mic is still. Pamela? Oh, I can't unmute Pamela. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm here. Hi. Where are you? Oh, hi. <laughs> forbidden touching of my face. I didn't actually raise my hand. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> you look like you're. <laughs> Welcome I, back. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I enjoyed, I enjoyed the work. I, I love the, the typewriter piece. As you know, I'm very fond of typewriters, but. <laughs> Good to see you, Pamela. Yeah. Good to see you. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Thank you very good. Okay. Thank you very much for your wonderful right. presentation, both of you. Good seeing yeah, you guys. Good to see okay. you all. Thank yeah. you for joining. Thank you.